tonight, uh, Jane O'Neill um, is presenting War and Peace and Winslow Homer, the Civil War and its aftermath. Um, Jane O'Neill, if you haven't joined us, joined us uh, for any of these pre presentations before, um, Jane O'Neill holds a master's in art history from Boston, Boston University and a master's in education from the Harvard University Graduate School of Education. She is a New Hampshire native and has worked at some of the state's most esteemed cultural institutions, including the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen, where she served as executive director and the Courier Museum of Art, where she held the role as senior educator. Jane founded the cult Courier's Alzheimer's Cafe and led the tour program that for the museum and the Frank Lloyd Wright designed Zimmerman House. She has taught art history at the college level for more than a decade, most recently at the New Hampshire Institute of Art. Um, her organization, her nonprofit is Culturally Curious and Culturally Curious's mission is to engage, educate and unify groups through facilitated art experiences that inspire and foster critical and creative thinking, as well as an appreciation for our shared humanity. Tonight, she'll present, as I said, War and Peace and Winslow Homer. One of America's most celebrated artists, Winslow Homer was on the front lines of civil war, documenting battles and moments of quiet contemplation in scenes that have come to define the conflict. Homer's paintings after the war show a beautiful, if uneasy, peace in America. And I think this is going to be a really fascinating presentation for this time of year. Thank you so much, Jane. Thank you so much, Jess. And thank you, everybody, for taking an hour out of your day to learn a little bit more about Winslow Homer. And we get to indulge in some pretty incredible paintings together um, for this next hour. So we are going to be looking at one of the most celebrated American artists of all time. And it is no stretch to say that he's probably America's most highly regarded artist of the 19th century. Winslow Homer really launched his career with the Civil War. So we'll be looking at some of his greatest prints and then how he transitions into a fine art artist along the way and some of his beautiful works that come afterwards. So. We will be getting back to this beautiful painting that's been on the screen for the past few minutes a little bit later on. But let me give you a sense in terms of how we're going to move through the material tonight. <clears throat> We're going to start off with an introduction to Winslow Homer. I like this picture over here because it seems like a little bit of an awkward introduction that's happening. We'll touch on that in just a second. And then we'll get familiar with some of his illustrations of the Civil War and, and really get a good sense in terms of what they mean to us as Americans. Uh, I want to give a little bit of a bigger context to them too. And then Winslow Homer does this pretty remarkable transition from being an illustrator to being an oil painter and a watercolorist. And so uh, he really launches that professional aspect of his painting career right around the same time. And so we'll see that he takes up a lot of um, similar subjects. And then what comes next but reconstruction. And he gives us a sense in terms of what America looks like in the years um, immediately following the Civil War. And then we wrap things up very nicely with um, a, a pretty remarkable painting from uh, the end of his career. So just to touch on this image one last time, it's called Contraband. It's from 1875, and it's an image of a Union soldier from the, the Civil War. We'll talk a little bit about the interesting uniforms of the Union soldiers. And he is uh, sitting across from a young Black child who, and I should mention that this picture is called Contraband which directly refers to essentially any enslaved person from the South that crosses the battlefield uh, during the Civil War and wins their freedom. So this is a, a newly freed child. And um, this could very well be uh, essentially the first time this Union soldier sees a Black person. And it's a pretty... Um, 
it, I would say it's a pretty awkward, almost tense interaction between the two of them. Notice that the child is reaching for the canteen that is still wrapped around the, the soldier's body, and he doesn't necessarily seem to be um, freely handing it over. So we're going to be unpacking all of these interesting interactions along the way. I just wanted to note that this is a watercolor over here, and it is, it's I, to me, just breathtakingly beautiful. But let's get started with an introduction to the artist, the man behind the mustache. Here is Winslow Homer. This is a portrait uh, created of him in 1865 by another artist named Oliver Ingraham Lay. Now, Winslow Homer is a local boy. He was born in Boston in 1836, and he grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which was really um, a, a rural area at the time. He was the second of three sons in his family. And as far as we know, he really had no formal education as an artist, but we do know that his mother was a, a pretty accomplished watercolorist in her own right. And so there's no doubt that she gave him a foundation there. Now, after Winslow Homer uh, graduated from high school, he began his career as an apprentice to a Boston-based lithographer named J.H. Buford. And I won't belabor uh, explaining the lithography process, but these are the lithography tools over here. And it's... Um, it's a way to reproduce an image that involves a lot of different washes, um, pressing paper against a lithographer's stone, and it was um, it was work that that Winslow Homer described as as treadmill for him, and he was primarily reproducing artwork for the cover uh, for um, for sheet music, and occasionally he would get to design his own. So this is an example of a really early Winslow Homer. It's called the Rat Catcher's Daughter. Apparently, it's a polka tune, but there's this nice little design work over here with the cat and the rat and um, in this ribbon sort of unifying all the elements of the picture here. Now, like I said, he wasn't necessarily happy at J.H. Buford. So within a few years, he um, officially becomes a freelancer. He's 21 years old. He sets up a shop in Boston. And it was at this time that, um, that there's this market for illustrations. It's growing rapidly. We can see his depiction here of the Boston Common um, uh, that was published in Harper's Weekly. And, and one of the things that Winslow Homer is doing so well at this early stage in his career is that he has a great sense for changing fashions. Um, just, you know, the slightest uh, uh, change in terms of, you know, the size or placement of a ruffle on, on, a, on a woman's dress and he can get it and he can get it, it uh, published very quickly. So there's early success there. And he was, um, as a freelancer, getting illustrations placed in a number of major magazines. So all of this is going really well for him. And um, in the years leading up to the Civil War, or he decides that he wants to kind of make a go at, of it as an artist and, and pull up stakes from Boston. And he heads down to New York City in... Um, in, in 1859. So it's it's really right as the Civil War is, is really just kind of brewing there. So in 1860, uh, Harper's offers him a, a, a position and actually he turns it down. The Civil War has not yet started. And Winslow Homer actually said, the slavery at Buford's was too fresh in my recollection to let me care to bind myself again. From the time I took my nose off that lithographic stone, I have had no master and shall never have any. It's just really interesting interesting to me that he is framing all of this within the terms of slavery, uh, because certainly that is going to be a primary focus once he gets going um, as an artist. So he's on the cusp of launching his career. We know, of course, that the Civil War breaks out the following year, and he is engaged by Harper's Weekly to go to the front lines. We'll get more into that in just a moment. But I wanted to stay on Winslow Homer um, for just a beat here. And I have these two pictures side by side. Um, it, slightly, I will admit, because it sort of makes me giggle. Uh, this is a very widely reproduced image of Winslow Homer. And honestly, it wasn't until I was doing research for this program that I realized that he he was bald at the time that the, that the photograph was taken and that there's another image in the series. Uh, now, I it 
it's sort of a silly comparison here, but it sort of gets to the fact that Winslow Homer was an enigmatic figure. I mean, you can know so much about him and, and not know, you know, really what he looked like. He had no public life. He had no journals. There were really no letters to speak of. He never started a school. There were no... Um, protégés that came after him. Now, at the end of his life, when his career has been, you know, highly celebrated, there were biographers knocking down his door. People wanted to tell his story. And he said to them, the most interesting part of my life is of no concern to the public. I must decline to give you any particulars in regards to it. So we really don't know much about him. He didn't really have any close friends, uh, no romantic relationships, and he never got married. In fact, um, just knowing what we know in terms of how much money he was making, he probably could not have supported a wife or a family until he was well into his 40s. It took a while for, um, for him to really get some uh, financial traction in his, um, in his career. We do know that he was closely attached to his parents throughout his life and uh, especially to his older brother. But we can see in, this, in these photographs, he was sort of a slight man, a little bit wiry, very elegant in his dress and bearing, but of course, uh, prematurely balding. And it is almost as though he's kind of hiding behind that very large mustache. Now, knowing all this, it probably it won't come as a surprise to you to learn that there aren't self-portraits of, of Winslow Homer. He wasn't sitting around gazing into a mirror and trying to um, capture his likeness, but it is generally thought that this late painting from 1893 um, called The Fox Hunt could perhaps be like a self-portrait of Winslow Homer. He painted this when he had already moved to the coast of Maine, was sort of living as a little bit of a recluse. Uh, obviously, this is years after the Civil War. Now, why on earth would anybody think that this is a self-portrait? Well, it seems to have some relationship to self here because, well, and it seems pretty important because this is also the largest painting he ever created. It's about six feet wide, so it really kind of holds a wall. And and on it, of course, the, our eyes are drawn to this orange fox leaping across the snow, um, trying to, to really survive as this group of crows, a murder of crows, is coming to attack him. It's, um, it is the middle of winter. There's really no place to escape to because, of, of course, the, the ocean is just beyond this fox here. And of course, everyone is starving and desperate for food. So why would anybody think that this is about Winslow Homer? Well, notice that the way he signed his name, first of all, his signature is over here in the snow, sort of sinking into the snow in the same way that this fox is as he's um, dashing for his life. Notice too that the letter R has this tail that sort of um, bushy, almost like a fox's tail. But when it comes right down to it, I think a lot of uh, art historians associate the character of a fox with Winslow Homer himself, it's sort of sly, aloof, shrewd, and yet still elegant. So all of these, all of these aspects of, of being a fox um, are, are sort of closely associated with Winslow Homer and, and the way he, um, the, the way he conducted his life. So we'll wrap up with our our understanding of the artist, which granted is very is very slim, um, with these last few images here, a photograph of him from later on in his life, and a few watercolors of um, these sort of rugged outdoorsmen, which he becomes pretty famous for depicting towards the end of the 19th century. Now, um, as I was a, a, a grad student, and even as an undergrad, I, I always sort of felt like my, my male uh, uh, professors really loved <laughs> Winslow Homer. There seemed to be something about him that really draws in a male audience. And I think part of it is that he, he uh, created so many images like this, this sort of anonymous, masculine, rugged type. And I think because we know so little about Winslow Homer himself, art historians tend to sort of transcribe this identity onto the identity of the artist as, as well. And there's something certainly heroic about an artist that launches himself in the midst of a civil war. So let's Let's shift gears right now and turn our attention to the war and start to consider what Winslow Homer's um, place in this war really looked like. So we're going to start off with a pretty complicated image here, but it's it's one for you to sort of feast your 
eyes on. Um, as I give you a little bit of, of the backstory here, this is an image called Wounded. It's from 1862. And in it, you can um, clearly see some uh, Civil War soldiers that have been wounded. We've got a soldier with an amputated leg over here. But front and center, there is a woman at home who's just read a letter and she is collapsed on the table um, sobbing. And so we have this notion of physical pain and emotional pain. Everybody's wounded because of, of, um, of what's happening in the midst of this war. So, um, so continue to sort of feast your eyes on what's going on here. As I tell you a little bit more about Harper's Weekly and, um, and Winslow Homer's relationship with them. Uh, now, first big picture, the Civil War was really the first big visual event of this country. And so there's, there's just this small number of illustrators who were there on the front who could capture it in real time and give the entire country some sense of what this battle looked like. Of course, photography existed, but the, the machinery of it was still quite cumbersome. You couldn't easily move it around. And the development um, times were, were, so, uh, were so slow in comparison to an artist sort of dashing off um, a sketch that it couldn't capture the war in real time in the same way that that human hands could really. Now, Harper's Weekly had um, had a, a critical role in telling the story of the war. It was, uh, as one art historian put it, sort of like Time Magazine and TV all rolled up into one. It was how you got your news. It was how you got sort of the gossip of the day. So looking for these illustrations of the war were um, was was really important um, in terms of of telling the the um, what was unfolding with with battles day to day. So um, so so before we turn our attention away from this image, I just want to point out what's happening down here in this left hand corner. We can see an artist sitting on a barrel. This could be a self portrait by Winslow Homer. I'm not totally convinced that it is, but it, we do see an artist uh, at work sketching and we see a couple of soldiers standing in line sort of at attention getting their portraits done. Now, Winslow Homer does do other illustrations of people who are sort of leaning over him, uh, really interested in what he's making. So then again, this could be him. Now, um, this next image here too is, um, uh, again, one for us to, to sort of feast our eyes on as we continue to think about the bigger picture here. This is just um, a, sort of a heroic image of the Union cavalry and artillery sort of starting off uh, in pursuit of the rebels. But we can see sort of how well equipped they are, how elegant the horses are. Now, um, I think it's important for us to keep in mind as we're looking at these images that Harper's took a side in the Civil War. We always think about um, the media today, uh, generally speaking, trying to be fair and balanced, right? Uh, it, it, during the Civil War, the, uh, the media took sides and most of the media was based in the North. So Harper's was really trying to tell the side and advocate for the Union. And so of course that meant that uh, that, that our artist here, Winslow Homer, was also trying to do the same thing. That's where his sympathies laid as well. But we'll see that it wasn't always so clear cut. Now, Harper's Weekly had about 200,000 subscribers. So these images were going out to a massive number of people. And then of course, going far beyond that as well. This was uh, lucrative for Winslow Homer. He was getting paid about $25 per uh, in, engraved image. And, um, and he wasn't doing the engraving himself. He would do a sketch, he would send it off to New York City, and an engraver in the city would um, have it reproduced for the publication. Now, $25 was good money at that time when Union soldiers were only making about $11 a week. So, so this was sort of the right place to be, but he was right there kind of in the trenches with the soldiers um, in facing all of the hardships that they were at the time. So before we uh, move away from this image, I just wanted to show you one what, just one kind of fascinating detail to me is that there is a hot air balloon off here in the distance. If you have good eyes, you can probably make it out uh, doing surveillance. It's just absolutely surreal to me to be thinking about hot air balloons in the midst of the Civil War. So let's uh, focus our attention now on some of his best known, most um, 
most celebrated images uh, produced for Harper's Weekly during the Civil War. This one is called the Bayonet Charge from 1862. This is from the Battle of Seven Pines in Virginia. Now, Winslow Homer was on the front line. He was embedded with the Union Army. Uh, did he see this battle in particular? Was he right there? He probably was a safe distance away, but this image certainly makes us feel like he was in the thick of it. It's kind of terrifying. So what we see here is the Union Army coming in from the left, attacking the Confederate Army over here. You can see that there are lines and lines, rows of soldiers running into battle. And this is really the last American conflict that we fought like this. There, there was this sense of honor in running into battle like this, as opposed to camping out in trench warfare like we see in the 20th century. Of course, this is a really effective way of getting yourself killed if you're a soldier. So we see some of that unfolding in the foreground. We see one soldier here whose um, elbow is pointed to the sky. He's grimacing here. He may have been shot by this sharpshooter in the foreground who doesn't have a bayonet on his rifle. He's there to actually shoot his gun. Um, you can see that he has probably also shot this drummer boy um, over here on the left who is falling forward and his drumsticks are on the ground. But we do see this line of Union soldiers with an array of expressions on their faces. You can imagine if you had a loved one who was away fighting, you'd be searching these faces, looking for for something familiar, looking for some way to understand what is going on through the face of somebody who looks similar to your loved one. These images would be so important. Now, the Battle of Seven Pines was pretty much a draw. There was no winner here, but Winslow Homer really makes it look like the Union Army sort of has the upper hand. They're coming in with all this force sort of spreading across that center line of the image. So there are kind of subtle ways that he is showing um, the dominance of, of the North here, but he's also relying on sort of standard tropes in terms of storytelling when it comes to depicting wars. Now, his most famous image from the Civil War is called the Army of the Potomac, a sharpshooter on picket duty. This is also from 1862. And this was an image that was really haunting to Winslow Homer in particular, and I think shocking to the public at large. This is another, um, another element of modern warfare. Uh, this is uh, a, a soldier who can uh, essentially camp out pretty much camouflaged from the enemy. And with the uh, with this kind of revolutionary technology, this rifle with a scope here, they're able to uh, uh, fire at someone up to about a half a mile away. And the idea that somebody had this kind of power um, in the midst of the Civil War drove soldiers to near nervous collapse uh, on either side. It was really uh, horrifying that um, that anyone could, could essentially take someone's life in this way. There was no honor in this kind of combat. At least that was how it was seen at the time. So to show this soldier, even though it was a Union soldier, um, up uh, up in a tree here who is um, who is just looking down the scope and um, ready to ready to eliminate someone's life. This was a, a truly terrifying scene. Now notice how uh, there's this is an image that's really all about balance, right? This is a soldier who almost looks like he's falling off the back of the tree. His foot is wedged over here between the, the trunk and the branch. His body is sort of balanced by hanging onto the same branch where his, his rifle is also balanced. And then you almost get the sense of like scales here with the um, canteen that has been tied uh, over here to another branch. So for Winslow Homer, the man who wrote so little, we do know that this was a particularly uh, terrifying notion to him. He actually wrote a letter to a friend about the experience of, of looking down the scope of one of these rifles. And he wrote in a letter, this is what I saw. There's a little design here. We're looking down that scope. You 
can easily put someone at a great distance in the crosshairs. And all it takes is a little squeeze of your finger and that person is dead. Winslow Homer wrote, I looked through one of their rifles once. The impression struck me as being as near murder as anything I could ever think of in connection with the army. And I always had a horror of that branch of service. So there was a real perspective that he was trying to share with uh, when he created that sharpshooter. Now, some of his other images, I'm just gonna sort of move through them kind of quickly. This is uh, a Union uh, uh, Army surgeon. Here he is, we see him from the back sort of desperately working on an injured soldier and people with um, varying degrees of injuries are, are being brought in to be seen by this surgeon. One person's being brought in on a cot. This is a horse-drawn ambulance sort of in the center background. Other soldiers are carrying in um, one of their comrades. And then we have a soldier who's sort of standing and waiting to be seen, probably um, the least affected out of all of them. But we can also see in the background that the war a battle is, is raging on here. Incidentally, this is apparently one of the uh, most highly collected, uh, sought after uh, reproductions of, of Winslow Homer's work. Now, this next image is from early on in the war, and it's called A Bivouac Fire on the Potomac. It's from 1861, and it's just a scene of soldiers you know, dealing with the boredom of, of, of being at war, but not actually fighting. There's a lot of downtime and Winslow Homer ca captures a lot of this downtime. And in this scene in particular, we can see um, soldiers around a fire. Some of them are playing cards here in the foreground. But of course, what's most interesting is that the there is a black figure who is at the center of this composition, um, whose body is, is nearly silhouetted against everybody else who is illuminated by the light from this fire. And this black figure is dancing, performing for these soldiers. Uh, and if you have good eyes, you might even notice that there's another black figure here who is playing a fiddle. And his face is kind of this gross caricature, a, a stereotype of African Americans from the 19th century, really right in line with what was um, pervasive in, in, um, in media and, and popular culture at the time. So here's Winslow Homer, an artist whose sympathies are, are with the North. And um, at, at this point in his career, his, his artwork, his depiction of African-Americans is as um, rooted in negative stereotypes as you know anybody from the South, really. We'll see that um, over the course of the war, this, this radically changes. Um, more scenes of, of soldiers um, during downtime. This is actually a Thanksgiving scene, so probably uh, pretty different from the Thanksgiving that we all experienced last week. In this case, these are soldiers that couldn't go home. And so these are, are, are two in the foreground that are, are pulling the wishbone. Uh, presumably either one of them who wins this little competition is going to wish to go home. Uh, we can see that the war drums in the background are stacked up here. This is not a time for battle. This is a time for this kind of quiet contemplation. Even the knife in the foreground is not there. Um, for purposes of violence, it's there to carve the turkey. Just a few more images, uh, illustrations from the war. Winslow Homer um, captured a, a number of aspects of, of wartime life, including the contributions of women, uh, whether they are assisting uh, soldiers uh, in terms of, of administering last rites or, or praying with them, or um, perhaps they're helping wounded soldiers write letters up above, they are uh, making bandages. In any event, it, I think it's really Kind of progressive that Winslow Homer was taking up this subject, but also note that the women he's portraying are still contributing to the war efforts in very feminine roles for the time. So, um, so not really stepping outside of bounds um, in any way that would make the readers of Harper's Weekly feel too uncomfortable. Winslow Homer also did um, some wonderful scenes of homecomings. This one is in the midst of the war. This is, um, I believe it's from 1863 and it's soldiers that are home on leave. And so these, uh, we have these really kind of 
uh, uh, charming sort of uh, reunion scenes, whether it's between soldiers and their loved ones, or uh, you know their sweethearts or their family members. Here we have a soldier in the in in kind of the front of this line reuniting with his mother. Now all of these images uh, really uh, pull at your heartstrings, and you can imagine if you were a, a, a subscriber to Harper's Weekly, if you had somebody who was uh, away fighting, I mean you would just sort of drown yourself in these images. They would provide some sense of solace. Notice too that a lot of these figures almost seem like copy paste, copy paste. Winslow Homer definitely had a type, both male and female, that he tends to go back to, it, not just in his illustrations, but for a lot of his paintings as well. So we'll wrap up on his illustrations with an image from 1865 that's called The Empty Sleeve at Newport. And this sort of gives us a sense in terms of what happens after the war. We have a, a wounded soldier here whose arm has been amputated. The, the empty sleeve has been sort of pinned up in his jacket, which means that he's unable to drive his own carriage here. So the woman in his life, whether this is his girlfriend or his wife, has had to figure out how to do that for herself. And so we see this um, really sort of... Um, uh, resigned woman in the foreground who understands that her life has, per, has profoundly changed because of, of this of her husband's injury and and he's also uh, contemplating this kind of role shift in their dynamic as well. So Winslow Homer sort of gives us a sense in terms of how the country is changing because of the uh, the war and and the injuries and the deaths uh, stemming from it. Now let's turn our attention to his paintings from this time, because this was an artist who always aspired to kind of get out of the illustrative game and get into the painting game. Now, of course, we're looking at another sharpshooter here, but what's really remarkable about this is that this is considered to be his first finished oil painting. So he is literally launching himself as an artist in the midst of the war, and he understands that, that some of the images that he's already created um, have have a real power to them. So of course he goes back to, to, to what has already worked so well. So this is his painting called Sharpshooter. Maybe you've seen it in person and it's up in, at, in Maine at the Portland Museum of Art. Let's just do a quick compare and contrast here. What is he doing that's similar? What is he doing that's different? The composition is nearly identical, although we don't have the canteen sort of uh, creating that sense of scales over here. One of the first things I noticed as I was looking back and forth at these images is that there's so much white around the soldier over here. And it's by necessity. You want to make your image for a news publication as, um, as legible as possible. You want people to look at it and understand what they're seeing. Over here on the right, with a painting that people would presumably spend more time looking at, you can really kind of camouflage your sharpshooter as he, as he would have been in, in real life. And I think that sort of speaks to that horror that, that Winslow Homer felt about about this particular kind of warfare or activity during, during wartime. Um, so there's less white space, less of this negative space or around the soldier, although his body is still legible. You, you do notice that, um, that his face is less clear. And I think it sort of speaks to that anonymity of, of somebody who sort of camped out in a place um, that could easily take away your life. So he's captured, I think, a lot of the great essence from the original print. Now, uh, another great Winslow Homer image from uh, the Civil War is this one here called Home Sweet Home from 1863. This is at the National Gallery of Art, so you've got to believe it's, it's really one of his best images from the war. Now, it's not just a picture about these two guys in the foreground, although don't they just kind of seem miserable to be kind of camping out over here? I might just be projecting, but we see their, their low tent, their little campfire. I look at this standing figure who's kind of holding his back this way, and I just imagine sleeping on the ground isn't as much fun as you think it's going to be. <laughs> over here, another figure who's just kind of slumped over, um, looking kind of bored. You know, there is a lot of downtime uh, when you're not fighting. 
But really the key to understanding this painting is what's going on in the middle ground here. Lean on in because if you've got good eyes, you can see that there's a lot of instruments. There is an army band that's actually playing in the background. And these army bands would play all afternoon long if these soldiers weren't fighting. And the Confederate side and the Union side were oftentimes encamped so close together that their bands would spar with each other throughout the day if there wasn't an actual battle going on. So the Union side would play Star Spangled Banner and then the Confederate side would answer with Dixie and it would go on and on and it would really rile people up. But then amazingly, at the end of the day, sort of just before dinner to wind people down again, everything gets a little bit quiet and both sides played together a song called Home Sweet Home. And it was this reminder to everybody who was listening um, of all the things that they'd left behind. So these soldiers who are maybe um, not feeling quite so comfortable in this setting here are actually thinking about the people they left behind, probably the much more comfortable beds that they left behind, uh, essentially all, all of the wonderful aspects of being home. So it's this moment of quiet contemplation that's happening in the foreground. Also, the great detail here, this is hardtack, um, uh, 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 the sort of dry food that the soldiers would eat which was certainly anything but sweet. So um, great little insight into life um, uh, for a lot of these soldiers. Now, sometimes uh, Winslow Homer would get pretty close to describing a battle in his paintings. This is called Defiance, inviting a shot at Peters before Petersburg. Um, this is from 1864. And this is an imagined scene. This is something he could have never seen because in this image, we're actually behind enemy lines. This is the Confederate side with a little barricade or, or fortification and the soldiers kind of hiding out here. Way across this field would have been where the Union was. Now, um, what's happening in this scene? I remember, I think I was an undergrad when I first saw this image, and I remember my professor talking about how the waiting that was involved um, for these soldiers before a battle started. And with Petersburg, it was like nine months. The waiting could drive people insane, especially if you think that there are sharpshooters anywhere. Notice how they would cut down the trees. Um, so, so I remember the first time I learned about this picture, a professor sort of described it as this young man who had gone insane from the waiting and was ready to sort of give up his own life just to get something happening, inviting a shot. He's, he's saying, use my body as a target. And there are these little puffs of smoke in the distance because people are actually uh, firing at him. And this is a good way to get a battle going, isn't it? Um, but because of uh, sort of my my more recent research on Winslow Homer and his and um, and sort of the way he looked at, um, at at fighting in the Civil War, I think that there's another way to look at this picture, and I think it has an interesting relationship to the sharpshooter. Actually, uh, Winslow Homer had a disdain for uh, soldiers, even if they were Union soldiers, who um, who would hide in a tree, who wouldn't present themselves and their whole body into battle in a more traditional and, and in his eyes, I think more honorable or noble way to, um, to, to camouflage yourself, to hide in this way. There was no honor in it. And I think even though this was the enemy, Winslow Homer saw some dignity, saw some honor in presenting your full self into a battle scene like this. Now we can't talk about defiance without talking about another gross caricature of an African-American figure here. Winslow Homer is still, um, still painting stereotypes at this point. Uh, his paintings are so um, highly regarded through, throughout uh, American art historical circles for their naturalism, but he abandons that um, when he's painting African-Americans. And we'll see in the next year or so, something dramatic shifts. Now, uh, this next image that I wanted to share with you is one that maybe you've seen in person. It's at the Harvard Art Museums. It's called Pitching Coits. And it's a large painting. It's about two feet high by about four feet wide. It was painted in 1865. And get a load of these uniforms forms, right? <laughs> this is really sort of outrageous when you look at this. This is a, a volunteer infantry from New York. They called themselves the Zouaves, and they based their uniforms on um, 
Algerian mercenaries of all things. I, I think they were in it for the clothes. <laughs> These are quite quite the getup. Um, and you'd think that, you know, because of the, the revolution, um, that, that soldiers would have known you just don't wear red into battle. So as you can imagine, this made them very easy targets. I think in one of their first major battles, uh, about three fifths of the Zouaves were killed. So we see a few of them left over, some of them looking a little forlorn, but most of them just looking really bored. But when I look at this picture, I'm just reminded of the fact that Winslow Homer was interested in fashion and he was particularly good at capturing it. And I think that's sort of what's going on with an image like this one. Now, this next picture is um, is a really sort of critical picture in terms of Winslow Homer's um, focus and his attention and empathy when it comes to African Americans sort of shifting. It's called The Bright Side. It dates to 1865. And, um, and so this picture, we can see soldiers are, are, are I, I should call, uh, they, they're actually army teamsters. These, these men would have get, been contraband as well. And there's four men lying on the ground up against the Silby tent. One, two, three, four. Each one of them is wearing a different style military hat. A fifth man is poking his head sort of comically out of the, out of the tent, looking directly at us. Now, as teamsters, they would have been responsible for moving equipment, moving supplies in these covered wagons in the background, uh, using the mules that also look pretty exhausted there. So it was draining work, exhausting work, and, and that's why we see them lying here, sort of uh, catching up on some rest. Notice that the figure in the foreground is um, holding a whip that connects him back to this work in the background, but I think it also sort of prompts us to think about corporal punishment and the abuse of, of enslaved people people in the South, escaping that, and then, you know, suddenly having this power, this authority, uh, when you come to the, the side of the North, but make no mistake, uh, as, as contraband, they, they weren't totally free. I mean, they were in service of, of the U.S. Army here. Now, the Winslow Homer has completely changed his approach to painting African Americans at this point. It's just been a very short amount of time, but he's not using the caricatures. Instead, we have naturalistic depictions of individualized faces here. Has he come a complete 180? Some art historians argue, no, he hasn't. That he's still using tropes, negative tropes, in order to describe these men. One of them being the trope of the indolent black man, the lazy black man. Um, if you compare this to a genre painting from a couple decades earlier, this is an image called Farmer's Nooning from 1836, painted by William Sidney Mount. And in this scene, you can, uh, you can see several white farmers um, uh, taking a break in the middle of the day, some of them still being industrious. But uh, this black man kind of luxuriating in the hay as he takes a nap in the sun. And decades later, Winslow Homer's picture of, of you know, still a naturalistic uh, uh, black figures at this point are still lying on the ground. They're not actually doing this hard, heavy work that is being, that they're associated with. And I think this argument that he's still using this negative trope, I think is reinforced when we look at this next picture that's called Army Boots. It's from right around the same time, 1865. This picture's at the Hirshhorn Museum of Art in um, in DC. Now, these two boys would have been contraband as well. And when you were still young, when you were a child, you had a certain role to play in the Union Army. Um, you could have been a cook, you could have been a laundryman, or you could have been a valet. In this case, we feel like we are peeking into this tent and we see these two young boys um, and we've interrupted their card game. Uh, one of them looks out directly at us, smiling. The other one we can see is sort of reaching for this canteen in the foreground. But the name of the picture is Army Boots. And we can see the boots over here that presumably one of these boys would have been responsible 
for shining. So once again, there's the sense of, uh, of you know, the, the negative stereotype of being lazy um, when it comes to a picture like this. Like we've caught them goofing off. Um, they're not doing the, the work that is um, expected of them. But I think that there's still this wonderful naturalism in terms of the way Winslow Homer is depicting these figures. And really, there weren't a lot of American artists that were painting Black figures in this way in the 19th century. Now, this next image from the war is really one of his most celebrated, and I think um, in the 20th century, probably one of his most reproduced images. It's called Prisoners from the Front, and it was painted in 1860. 66. This is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's about two feet high by three feet wide. And in this scene, we can see a Union uh, general. Incidentally, this general was the cousin of Winslow Homer, so somebody that he would have felt sympathy with. And he is confronting three Confederate soldiers, representative of, uh, of about a thousand Confederate soldiers that, that this Union general uh, was effective in capturing. These are two more Union soldiers kind of guarding them just behind. And the, the Confederacy is represented by this kind of ragtag threadbare group here. One of them sort of looks like a young aristocratic man who seems to be in kind of direct confrontation with the general. One of them is a much older man, a surprisingly old man to be fighting in this war, who is wearing, you know, these torn and tattered clothes clothes, his hair is really long, his beard is really long. And then we have this third uh, figure here who is described with much less detail. We don't get nearly as much detail in the face over here, but there's sort of this confident slouch to the pose that gives you the sense that he is a young man. And if you spend a little time looking at his, um, his, his clothing, his accessories here, you realize that he is most likely that same figure that we saw in defiance. He's got the hat. He's got this kind of diagonal um, wrap around his body that's probably like some sort of blanket or bedding there. So interesting that um, that Winslow Homer has created this, this other further association from this painting. If you zoom in on prisoners from the front over here, you can even see that this young boy has four bullet holes in his hat. It's almost as though, you know, what happened in, in the previous painting is, is uh, is being illustrated over here. Now, if we get back to that larger idea about Winslow Homer and his, um, the sense that he was ill at ease with the way that modern warfare really looked, we can see that kind of playing out through all three pictures here, this idea of the dishonor of hiding yourself, the, the honor or nobility of presenting yourself at battle, and then perhaps the extension of that, even though the, these soldiers are have been captured, perhaps there is some honor in, in the way that he's portrayed them. And I think that that really gets to the extended audience understanding of this particular image. I was listening to a lecture uh, uh, um, from a Winslow Homer scholar, and he talked about how uh, when he was a young man in the 1960s, this was like the picture that was reproduced um, to mark uh, the 100th anniversary of the Civil War. And he said it was such a, such a smart or uh, emblematic picture to, to reproduce because depending on which side you'd been rooting for, if you you were still had like Southern allegiances, or if you were pro union, you can see heroism on either side. Um, the, we can see a conquering general over here on the right, but we can also see this ragtag group of soldiers that are down on their luck, but are still willing to fight tooth and nail um, for their side of this war. And I think if, uh, once again, if, if you still ha had, uh, um, any sort of, of, of allegiances to that Southern cause, even in the 1960s, you could look at these figures here and sort of see some honor in them. Certainly Winslow Homer saw honor in the way that they fought. All right, so let's wrap up uh, Winslow Homer's Civil War paintings with this last image here that's called Near Andersonville from 1866. This is Winslow Homer's only wartime image of an African-American woman. And notice 
there's no stereotype here, stereotyping here. This is um, a naturalistic depiction of, of like a fully realized human being. Now, this picture was lost for about a hundred years, found in somebody's attic, misattributed for quite some time. And then these very dedicated Winslow Homer uh, scholars sort of tracked down the title and, and sort of burrowed into the meaning. The title, of course, refers to an infamous uh, camp, uh, prisoner camp in the South. So a camp where Union soldiers would have been taken. Andersonville um, is, is a place where a about 13,000 Union soldiers died due to um, no food and water, uh, lack of sanitation. It was a really a horrific uh, um, uh, scene from the Civil War. And in this particular uh, image, we can see what it really means. We see the, the, the human impact of it because we have this young woman, presumably in the South, presumably enslaved, um, who is watching these Union soldiers being marched to this prison camp. And so her very fate is like resting in the balance here. She She's kind of coming out of the darkness of slavery and into the light of freedom. So, um, so there's a lot of nuance here. There's certainly more humanity to the figure. Let's turn our attention now to what happens post-war in this uneasy piece that Winslow Homer um, depicts in the, in, um, in the years of Reconstruction. This is probably his most famous painting from the years following the Civil War. There's a, a two different versions of it. This version is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. It's from 1872. And it, what, I mean, what can you say? It's beautiful. It's a gorgeous painting. And, um, and in it, I mean, we don't really see any signs of the war, do we? It's, um, it's nostalgic. It's picturesque. It's kids playing, green fields, blue skies, a quaint little red one, one room schoolhouse here. But there are other ways to look at this. And one of the primary kind of alternative ways to look at it is, um, is that the relationship of these boys, they're playing a game called called snap the whip. So they're sort of flinging each other's bodies around that the relationship between their bodies is um, representative of the relationship between the two sides, North and South during the Civil War. And you can read it from right to left. In this case, holding on so tightly, trying to preserve the union, one of them then slips away. There's this push pull. And then of course, eventually the South falls over here. So that's one possible way of reading it. But incidentally, Winslow Homer was um, um, for the most part, uh, creating these, these kind of nostalgic, sweet views of American life uh, in the years following the Civil War, images of children playing, images of, of you know, beautiful young women who were working on farms or in schools. And, and this it, really nobody else was painting these subjects in this way. And he kind of opened the door for artists like uh, Norman Rockwell in the 20th century to focus on the activities of children in this way. But some of Winslow Homer's paintings are really direct references, explicit references to the war. This is such a powerful painting. It's also at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and it's called Veteran in a New Field. Um, so we go from, you know, that sweet field where the kids are playing to this wheat field, um, this golden um, uh, uh, wheat field where we see the back of a soldier, an anonymous figure. We kind of project ourselves into his body. We are there with him psychologically. What might it feel like to go from a battlefield back to the, the, the wheat fields that you're tending? Um, we can see a, a, a reference to his service from his jacket and his canteen over here. Uh, he's got this massive, um, massive uh, 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 load of work <laughs> in front of him and his eyes are trained downwards. We don't see an end to this labor here. He is sort of stuck in the midst of it. And Winslow Homer makes an interesting choice here. As, as we can imagine, this soldier is sort of thinking about all that he's seen during the battles that he that he witnessed and that he was engaged in, thinking about the, all of that death, Winslow Homer edits this um, this tool that um, that this figure is using for harvesting from a cradle harvest that has multiple um, sort of tines to it, like a fork, and he reduces it down to something that looks sort of like the Grim Reaper's side, so a, a more direct reference to death. I used to think it was like 
this really kind of modern thing that he was doing where you could still, where he was actually suggesting the movement of this scythe, but instead he had actually painted out those tines, but the paint was so thin that we can now see um, what the original composition looked like. So in the end, we know that this is a picture about sort of a figure who's been haunted by what he's seen, that who's supposed to return back to his regular life. But of course, he has been forever changed by what he's witnessed in the war. Now, Winslow Homer also traveled back to the South after the war was done. And he created images that were so sympathetic to African Americans that his life was threatened. He was essentially chased out out of the South and, and told, you know, you're not welcome here because of these kinds of images. This is called Visit from the Old Mistress from uh, 1876. This is such a fascinating composition. It's, uh, and I should mention it's at the Smithsonian. In this scene, we see three Black women with a Black child um, and a white woman who was the mistress uh, entering into their space. There's a marked uh, distinction in the way that they're dressed. The, the white woman is wearing a, a, a kind of a fancy black dress with this elaborate lace collar. And the black women are wearing really sort of simple clothes. Uh, this central figure, it looks like, you know, there's holes in her clothes and it's maybe sort of patchwork back together. So there's really a, a clear class distinction now in addition to the racial distinction. And the air in this room is kind of thick with distrust. There's no sense in terms of what this relationship can really look like going forward. But we do see that things have changed, presumably when, um, when this was still, a, uh, uh, when slavery was still legal and these women were, were owned by this white woman, all of them would have had to have stood up when she entered the room. And of course, this figure over here on the left is, is still sitting down, um, almost looks as though she's ignoring the white woman in the room. But my eye always goes to the central figure here. And she's sort of a, a, an impressive figure. She looks really sort of um, physically impressive. But this expression on her face uh, paired with these kind of slouching shoulders here, just give me this sense uh, that she's just exasperated, like she's sort of at her wits end um, because of this particular dynamic between these women. It's a, a really, I think, a surprising picture to, be to have been created by a white male artist um, in the years following the Civil War. So, um, Incidentally, if, if, if the composition here sort of reminded you of the Civil War uh, uh, battlefield over here, I think you're right on the money. Uh, one figure on the right sort of confronting three others that are from another side. Uh, and that, that same sort of interesting uh, um, ambiguity in terms of how you read th this relationship, I think can sort of bleed over here. But uh, I think uh, Winslow Homer's uh, sympathy towards the Black women, I think, is, is much more clear in this case. And I think you can also see that in this picture uh, from 1876 from the Los Angeles County Museum of Art called Cotton Pickers, um, that empathy, that understanding or an attempt to understand um, the Black experience is um, is probably uh, best pictured here in terms of Winslow Homer's career. This is his first real sort of monumental picture, a figurative picture of African Americans. And if you didn't know the date, you'd probably think this is uh, still a, a pre-war image. I mean, nothing has really changed. These women are still picking cotton. They're still um, in, in a position of being subjugated. So in, in this scene, he gives us a sense of the monumentality of their task. This field looks like it goes on forever. The, um, the basket here, the gunny sack are pretty much already filled. But, um, but their work is essentially never done. He cuts them off at the knee here. They are mired in this, and it's as though their lives are not going to change here. Um, Winslow Homer had spent a little bit of time in France, and he was really taken with Barbizon school paintings, which um, tend to sort of harrow up. Um, uh, I, I should say, make, make heroes of peasants. So in this case, two paintings by uh, Jean-Francois Millet, you can see that um, 
that he's showing peasants working in fields and carrying heavy loads. And, and I think Winslow Homer is, is directly transcribing those notions into uh, the, the image of the two cotton pickers over here on the right. Also sort of interesting to reflect on, um, he gives us these powerful post-war images of people outside in these fields, working these crops and still sort of stuck in the past in really, um, really interesting ways, um, sort of against their will in, in, in both of these images. So in our last final uh, moments, I just wanted to share with you, uh, wrap this all up with, with the bow really quickly. Um, Winslow Homer uh, has this successful career for many decades following the Civil War. In the 1880s, he moves to Prout's Neck, Maine in Scarborough, Maine, just this little jet of land uh, sticking out into the Atlantic Ocean. He um, takes his family family's carriage house as his kind of home and studio. He's 75 feet away from the Atlantic Ocean, and he adds this second story porch that uh, is looking out at the water, and it really is probably the greatest artist studio of all time. And he begins to really focus on the power of nature, the power of the ocean in so many of his paintings. Also, incidentally, he was a little bit reclusive, so he also painted this sign that said snakes, snakes, and mice to get people to stop uh, bothering him while he was working. So as we probably best know when it comes to Winslow Homer, he took up these scenes of these like uh, uh, anonymous fishermen that he makes heroes who are kind of battling the elements, battling the ocean. And, um, and in this case with fog warning that's at the MFA in Boston, we can see this fisherman who is so far away from the ship that he needs to get to as this fog bank is rolling in. I think if any of us were in that boat, we know that we'd probably be gone over here with the herring net, we can see two more fishermen. We don't know them, but we can see the, the courage involved in doing this um, really physical work in the midst of like these uh, dangerously high waves here in the foreground. This one figure sort of cantilevering his body out of the boat in order to pull in um, the, these kind of sparkling herring. Now, um, before too long, Winslow Homer realizes that he doesn't even need the figures to tell the story of the awesome power of nature especially uh, when it comes to the Maine coastline. Uh, this is a painting that's just called The Coast of Maine from 1893 at the Art Institute of Chicago. Uh, this is called Weather Beaten from the following year. This is at the Portland Museum of Art. It's all about um, the, the, the weather, the elements, these uh, impressive waves just beating the, the, the shoreline here. Now, everything changes um, when Winslow Homer uh, begins to travel and he takes his father down to to Cuba and the Bahamas. Um, he, I guess he doesn't just stay in Maine all the time. And he does paint uh, what he sees while he's down there, including this image, which is probably something uh, sort of slightly different than, than uh, an observed scene. This is called the Gulf Stream from 1899. And this is the picture that sort of wraps up his Civil War paintings in with a bow. This is a picture that Winslow Homer um, continued to rework right up until 1906. This is uh, the artist standing in front of the picture. And we can see in this image uh, a Black man uh, lying down on a boat, a boat that has been uh, essentially disabled. There's no mast here. It's already been sort of beaten up. It is surrounded by sharks, seemingly very hungry sharks, because there is, there's blood in the water here. There is even a water spout in the distance and a tiny little boat on the upper left. But our, our figure here in the boat is looking off in the other direction. Perhaps he's unaware of it, or he has turned his head away, realizing that there is no safety, no savior for him. So how does this relate to the Civil War? Well, Winslow Homer loved to show these anonymous fishermen sort of battling the elements. They were heroes. They were working. Um, this figure over here is not working. Is he a hero? Does he fall more in line with the Black men that Winslow Homer was painting who were just kind of lying around during the Civil War? Or is this more of a meditation on the circumstances of African Americans at the end of the 19th century? Does, does Winslow Homer, is he trying to say that to be Black in America is to be surrounded by sharks here? Is to be in a situation where nobody's coming to save you? Is that what this picture is really about? There's so many different ways to appreciate it. I won't go into it too deep tonight, but I will say that there's this whole fascinating history about um, with our, our 
artists who are sort of placing um, or, or situating this history of, of the slave trade and this relationship of black bodies to the middle passage and being fed to sharks and being in danger of, of, of uh, sharks pre presenting this, this enormous danger to African-Americans. And I think Winslow Homer was certainly aware of that history and sort of playing off of it to a certain extent. I will share with you this one other image from the series where you can see almost the same boat here, similarly disabled, um, the, where the figure is gone. It's almost as though the sharks have come on board and there is blood on uh, on the, the, the top of the, the, the boat here. Very, very foreboding. It's such a powerful image here. So we'll wrap up with Winslow Homer at the end of his career. This is the last painting he did. It's called Driftwood from 1909. In fact, he wrote it right around the time he was, uh, or he painted it right around the time he wrote a letter to his brother where Winslow Homer was begging off going to Thanksgiving dinner and he said, I am painting. He's too busy to go because he's painting, but it was a great way to sort of summarize who he was, what his life was all about. He was painting. Um, he passed away at the age of 74 in his studio up in Maine, which of course you can go and visit today. It's owned by the Portland Museum of Art. And his remains were interred in this family plot at the Mount Auburn Cemetery um, back in Cambridge, Mass, where he grew up. So forgive me for going a little bit long today, but um, this was our chance to really kind of fully understand how Winslow Homer launches his career, his remarkable sort of progress in terms of his um, empathy in, in terms of, of, of depicting African Americans, his bravery in terms of delving into the subject, and the sort of outsized role in our, in our history that he plays because he documented the war in the way that he did. So I will end there for now, and I welcome any questions or comments you might have about Winslow Homer. I can see that there's a lot in the chat already. Let's see what I can get through here. Um, let's see. Uh, first, for questions and answers, uh, Rosamond has asked, what is the woman in, in the black dress holding? And I believe you're talking about this image here. Rosamond, that's a great question. I am not entirely sure. I always sort of imagined that this was something like a purse, but I'm not positive. If anybody has a better understanding of this, uh, please uh, please feel free to share. Interestingly enough, uh, most of the, uh, all of the reading that I've done about this hasn't touched on what's in her hand. So please, if anybody knows, please uh, jump in. I'll start looking at the chat here as well. Um, let's see. Oh, this is a great comment. Going back to the fox hunt, JD notes that um, that even the H in Winslow Homer's signature looks like the fox's ears. I love that. Hear those fox ears. Great catch there, JD. Um, is it a caricature or is it the inability of the engraver to depict dark skin in this medium? Kathy asks. And I wonder if you're looking, if that was in reference to uh, this image of the Potomac. Um, so, so is maybe that that uh, negative stereotype that I was pointing out there? Uh, Kathy's sort of wondering, is it just sort of the limitation on the part of the um, of the engraver, and that could very well be the case. But I think we sort of saw too that Winslow Homer's paintings were sort of in line, at least earlier on, with these kinds of depictions. So it might have been a little bit of Homer, it might have been a little bit of the engraver, but but I think that this is pretty much where Winslow Homer was in terms of his level of empathy and understanding. Luckily, we saw a, a little bit of a of an evolution there. Lynn says, "I'm assuming these are all dynamic scenes." Um, do we know how long it took him to sketch a scene? Lynn, great question. I, um, I saw one of the sketches or something similar to what he would have actually sent off to um, New York to, to be engraved. And believe it or not, it doesn't have anywhere near the kind of detail that we see here. I, I think that for the most part, uh, they were oftentimes pretty quick sketches. It looks like the sort of thing that an artist would have probably been able to produce well, with under an hour. Um, that's just my guess, but that's that's a great question. Um, Kathy says, also the wounded in the medic scene, the guy in the middle looks more like he is making a delivery of whatever is in the back in, in his backpack. 
back um, more than an injured soldier since another man is removing a large jar from it. Great attention to detail. I was wondering about that. That Okay, yes, that's wonderful, Kathy. Thank you for sharing that. I just assumed he was wounded and, um, and somebody was helping him remove his backpack, but I think you're right. He's probably delivering supplies there. I do see this soldier taking a, like a jar out of it. Uh, Karen says, was the soldier in the first painting you showed contraband wearing a Zouave uniform as well? Karen, I think you're right about that. There's certainly elements that seem um, sort of exotic for um, for a Union soldier. <laughs> uh, and I think a lot of the Zouaves wore these kind of fezes too. And they did actually change the color of their pants, I think, after that particularly um, bloody battle that they had. So I think that this is a Zouave. Um, Kathy says the clouds and the Zouaves are incredible, very realistic. Um, why make the sky realistic, but nothing else? Got the impression that the boots were the barefooted boys boots. Okay, so just moving along to the Zouaves. Now I got to look at those clouds. Let's see. Oh, yes, those are lovely. <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous clouds up there. Um, and she also says, I got the impression that the boots were the barefooted boys boots with his socks uh, still sitting in it. Oh, perhaps. Okay, so sort of understanding that that these could be belong to the boys. And as I'm looking here, there are other boots too. So maybe it, maybe you could sort of read it either way. Um, but that's a great attention to detail, Kathy. Thanks for sharing that. Oh, I love that people are are sort of are, are really delving into the details here and sharing them because obviously I'm just one person and there's no way I can get all of it right. So I really love um, all of this coming in and sort of uh, uh, broadening our understanding of what these works could uh, be about. Out. Um, Kathy says, is she watching or hiding behind the door frame? Uh, I'm not sure which work that is in reference to. I'm guessing. Oh, I'm guessing it's this one. Um, so I guess she's always, uh, bit, the, you know, everything that I've read about this is that she's sort of watching this, this march here. But, but yeah, it does sort of seem like she's still sort of protected here as, as though she could maybe watch and kind of remain unnoticed at the same time. That's a great question, though, because I think it sort of parses out, you know, um, her safety and her status in all of this, um, her very vulnerable status. Um, Wendy says, what a contrast of Harper's Weekly allowing African-Americans being depicted versus Rockwell's arrangement with the Saturday Evening Post. When Wendy is a, Wendy knows my programs. And so I, there is, I think, a really fascinating um, uh, parallel there. And now that I really understand Winslow Homer in a whole new way, I have to say, I think that that Norman Rockwell was looking back at his work quite a bit throughout his time with the Saturday Evening Post, but you hit the nail on the head with that one, Wendy. Absolutely. Jess says, what is the relationship between Homer and similar artists like John Singer Sargent? Like, um, great question. You know, because he, my understanding is that he was such a solitary figure. I'm not sure if he had relationships with other artists. I do know that he lived in sort of like an arts community when he first moved to New York City, but, um, but his legacy is really, you know, the man that paints the solitary outdoors figures, the guy who moves up to Maine. So I'm not sure he had really full artistic relationships, um, like art artistic colleagues that that um, sort of informed his work and that he sort of learned from. But just that's such a great question. That seems to be sort of like a missing element in his life. And maybe it's just that I don't know it. Um, Rosamond, thanks for your kind words. You too, Diane. Nancy, oh my goodness, all, all of your kind words really mean a lot to me. Um, oh, it looks like a fan to me, Kathy says, that um, in reference to um, visit from the old mistress. Maybe that is a fan. The South was very hot. Um, Sue, thank you so much. Wendy says her hand might be holding something that lifts up part of her billowing dress when walking. Oh, that's interesting too. Yes, I could imagine something like that because uh, uh, that is a floor length dress. Absolutely. Um, Karen, thank you so much for your kind words. Back to the boys with the pair of boots. Is there crumpled money to the right of the boys? Fascinating question. Let's go back here. To the right of the boys. I'm guessing you're looking over here. I'm not sure I see it. 
it's hard to say. This is a little bit of a grainy picture. I read all of this as like playing cards. And I think that they were in the middle of a game. Incidentally, um, there's a sketch of this, uh, of this picture and which you can find online. Like if you just Googled like army boots sketch, or maybe I even have it way in the back here. Um, maybe we can gather a little bit more about it. And, um, in, in the sketch for this picture, oh, I do have it, bear with me, <laughs> it's slide number 90. Um, we can see that there were originally going to be more, um, more children underneath. So it's a little bit hard to say. Um, it's interesting to see sort of what he preserves from the sketch to what uh, makes it into the final painting. Um, Sally, thank you so much for your kind words. It was really nice to see so many people come out tonight and that you're still on right now as I sort of fumble trying to find answers to these very wonderful, insightful questions and, and details that people are calling up. So I really appreciate everybody and their time. Jess, thank you so much for having me. Oh, absolutely, Jane. Um, our patrons love you so much. And uh, we will certainly be continuing with Jane O'Neill's uh, presentations. Uh, don't miss the next one, which is on December um, December 20th, uh, and Jane will be online to talk about Picasso's women. I love Picasso. Um, I've been to the Picasso Museum in Barcelona, and it's amazing, um, so I'm really excited for that one. And then, of course, we will be continuing with Jane, fortunately, uh, throughout 2023. So um, we really... I really appreciate all of you staying online with us and um, thank you so much, Jane, and have a great night, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Take care. We'll see you next month. Bye. Bye.